Uh, my name is Pat Hanlon. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I've been designated chair for tonight's meeting. And I'm calling the meeting to order. By my watch, it's 7.33 p.m. Um, I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair. So I'd like, first of all, to confirm that all of the members and anticipated officials are present. Um, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Christian Klein? Here. Good evening. Roger DuPont. Hello. Hello to you, too. Daniel Riccardelli. Here. Vankit Holy. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. For town officials, I think the only person I'm actually expecting for tonight is uh, Colleen Ralston, our administrative assistant. I'm here. Great. Um, we are outside council, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Paul. Uh, the board's peer review consultant, I think, is here, Sean Reardon. I am, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, the only issue, the only hearing we're going to have tonight is has to do with 10, uh, with 10 Sunnyside. Uh, appearing from the applicant is uh, uh, the lawyer, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Good evening. Um, Erica Schwartz, are you here? Yes. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Erica. I'm going to put in Gabby Geller, who I'm pretty sure is here too. She said like, got a great picture on her. Um, and then uh -huh. we'll let you go through the rest of your team when we finally get to talking about, about the conditions. Gabby, Gabby I, I assume you're there behind the picture. Yes, I'm here. I, I'm so, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, So we have a few the we have a few administrative items on our agenda tonight, and I'm going to go through them before we actually start in on the uh, on the hearing. That it's our main business tonight. Uh, there are three uh, matters. One of them is the approval of the minutes. Uh, we have had before us for now some time uh, uh, minutes from May twenty third, twenty twenty three, March twenty eighth, twenty twenty three and uh, February 28th, 2023. Um, and unless there's an objection, um, I'd like to take all of them together rather than go each one of them separately. Uh, but if anyone would want to break any of those sets of minutes out, you should let me know now. Okay, these have been around for us. I, I, I think Colleen knows whether she's made any changes in that in response to uh, our comments. Colleen, are these the same things or have there, have there been changes made? Um, no changes since I sent them out. Okay. Um, so at this point, the chair will entertain a motion to approve uh, the set of minutes that I just read into the record. Mr. Chair. Mr. Klein. I move that we approve the three sets of minutes uh, previously documented from uh, February, March, and May of this year. Right. Is there second. a second? second? Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, we'll go through the roll. Christian Klein. Aye. Uh, De Roger DuPont. Aye. Dan Ricardelli. Aye. Venkat Holy. Aye. Elaine Hoffman. Aye. Uh, Adam LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, the next item on our agenda is approval of a final decision in uh, docket number 3757, 18 Robin Hood Road. Um, yeah. Uh, you have had that actually, there have been um, virtually no changes in it since, uh, what I sent out to you, just correction of, uh, of some typos. Um, and, uh, if, are there any other corrections, uh, that anyone wishes to suggest now for other discussion? All right, seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion to approve uh, the final decision in section 3757, 18 Robin Hood Road. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Adam LeBlanc by just a whisker. Um, we'll go through the roll again. All in. Uh, the uh, uh, Christian Klein. Um, I wasn't present uh, on the hearing. I wasn't sure if I should vote on it. I think that probably you should you should not. Mr. Dupont. Aye. 
Uh, Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Ms. Hoffman, I believe you were not there for that one either. Is that correct? Correct. So, Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes. And the chair votes aye. Um, the final one is the approval of a final decision in 3734, 14 Oakland Avenue. Uh, I wanted to point out for the record, and it's all my fault that this happened, but that on the agenda, it appears actually as uh, 3731, 48 o Oakland Avenue, which is a decision that we approved several weeks ago. Um, and you also got this sort of late. I've gotten some comments on that. Again, they were mostly picking up typos. Um, and I uh, would, if, if, if you wish to, postpone that to give us a little bit more time to allow us to pro to revise the notification we can do that uh it's really up to you but uh if you if it is the sense of the board that we should move move forward before the chair would entertain a motion mr chairman mr dupont uh i would move to approve the decision is there a second second um that was mr holy i think mr Okay, it's hard to say because my screen is not lighting up when you're speaking. Um, okay, it's been moved and seconded. We'll go through the roll. Mr. Klein, I think that you were not there for this one no, either, right? Not present. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Ricardelli? Aye. Mr. Holy? Aye. Um, Ms. Hoffman, I believe you were there th the first night that we had the hearing, but not the second. Uh, so uh, within the absence of petition, let me go to Mr. LeBlanc, who was there both nights. Well, Mr. Okay, so the motion uh, carries in that, in that decision, which again is uh, 14 Oakland Avenue uh, is approved. And we've now gotten through the administrative items. Um, the... With me for a second. Um, so we're now going to turn to the uh, comprehensive permit hearing for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, the main purpose of tonight's hearing is to review the draft decision that is prepared was prepared by Mr. Haverty. Um, and our purpose tonight is to make sure that the board has all the facts that it needs to deliberate on that draft during the next phase of the meeting. Tonight is the time for discovering mistakes of fact, possible unintended consequences of proposed conditions, additional facts that might be relevant, and so on, um, in order to put ourselves in the position that when we go into deliberation mode, uh, that we, are, uh, we have the facts that we need in order to make an informed decision. Um, the draft decision is in the board agenda, so if you uh, if you don't happen to have it at readily at hand, uh, if you dial into the agenda, you'll find it there near the end, roughly 450 pages in from the beginning. Um, and I'd encourage you to follow along in the draft because it'll be a lot easier to uh, follow if if you're able to see the text that people are talking about. So this hearing began many months ago. Uh, we've discussed the proposed project in great detail in lots of sessions since then. And at the end of our session tonight, I'm expecting to close the public hearing. Once the hearing is closed, the board will begin a deliberation process that by law can take no longer than 40 days. During that period of time, we can't receive any new information from the applicant, from the town, from the public, from peer review consultant, or anyone else. Um, it will, of course, discuss the deliberations with Mr. Haverty, its 40B legal advisor, and as you know, the principal draftsman of the board's decision. Um, legally, as I said, we're required to make the decision in 40 days. If we close the public hearing tonight, then our decision will be due no later than Sunday, September 24th. Uh, we've scheduled our first deliberation session for Tuesday, September 5th, followed by a second session, if necessary, on September the 12th. See if I can. Um, before we get into the details of the hearing, I wanted to stress a couple of things. First of all, 
the board isn't deliberating tonight, and this isn't the time for the members of the board to be editing Mr. Haverty's draft. Uh, we'll have that opportunity to, I'm sure, Mr. Haverty's great regret um, in September. Uh, and you, if you wanted to see a really tedious meeting, you should see what those are like. Our questions for tonight will be aimed at making sure the board has the record it needs in order to uh, in order to make an in informed um, decision. Um, see if I can find the right. I guess the second thing is that again we should be following the uh, following through the decision as we can, and and people talk about it. One helpful thing would be to refer to things by number. If you're looking at Part Four, Section C1, I know it's hard to make yourself do that, but it would be helpful to others who are trying to find it and to. Uh, uh, Ms. Ralston, who is going to be trying to show the these these on the screen, uh, to know which is the language that you're talking about. And second is that not everybody is going to have a copy of the opinion before them. And so, if you can uh, just say enough about what it is you're planning to talk about, so that somebody who's not following along in the text uh, is able to understand the drift of the discussion, that that would be. Um, that would be helpful. Um, and so with that, what I'd like to do at the beginning is to ask Mr. Uh, uh, to ask Mr. Uh, Haverty to uh, introduce what, explain a little bit what the document is that we all have, uh, have before us, uh, how it fits into this process and what its general structure is. And then uh, I think we would move next to uh, uh Ms. Stanley O'Connor to uh, uh, have the applicant comment on how that decision looks to them and where they have problems and or suggestions or additional uh, conditions or provisions uh, to add. So Mr. Haverty, I wonder if you could start us off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we know, this is an application for a comprehensive permit pursuant to General Laws Chapter 40B, Sections 20 to 23. And the way that the Chapter 40B works is that the Board of Appeals actually is the permit granting authority for all local approvals necessary for the project to move forward. So that of necessity requires a fairly complex decision from the board. Um, under Chapter 40B, there are three different possibilities uh, of what a board can, can issue a, of a decision. It can either approve the application as submitted, which I literally have never seen happen ever. Mm -hmm. um, it can approve the, the, the application with conditions or it can deny the, the application. So in this instance, we've moved forward drafting a decision with the presumption that it was going to be an approval with conditions. And the purpose of the conditions is to make sure that the board is actually addressing issues of local concern. Um, which is sort of the fundamental issue under Chapter 40B. You have to weigh the regional need for affordable housing against legitimate issues of local concern. Um, a lot of the conditions and, and sort of provisions of a draft decision are programmatic. They address issues that occur in basically every Chapter 40B decision. So um, if you actually compare this draft decision to previously issued decisions by this board, you will see a lot of conditions uh, and findings and things of that nature that are repetitive. And you will also see a lot of things that are unique for this project. Um, so the way that the decision is broken down is the first section we have the procedural history. Um, and that just sort of tries to lay out exactly what was submitted and sort of the circumstances that are generally in place at the time of the, the submittal. The second is the jurisdictional findings. So chapter 40B has very unique requirements in order for uh, an applicant to be eligible to file a comprehensive permit application. Um, so this addresses those requirements. Um, there are also a number of safe harbors that are available to a town um, that's also addressed within sort of these jurisdictional findings. Um, and then we go to the factual findings, and these factual findings are obviously very project specific, um, and they try to address all of the different factual 
issues that have been brought up throughout the, the course of the hearing on the project. Um, and they're broken down into different subsections. And then from there, we go to the, the conditions of the project. So these are the conditions that the board is imposing to make sure that the development is going to move forward in a way that again, properly addresses legitimate issues of local concern. So the conditions are then further broken down into different sections. Um, there's the general conditions, um, and these really are intended to address the, the issues to identify exactly what the plans are that are being approved. Um, then from there, there's also some jurisdictional issues with regards to transfer of the permit and things of that nature. Um, the second section is affordability. Um, and those really are addressing programmatic issues under Chapter 40B. A, a lot of these are really within the exclusive jurisdiction of the subsidizing agency. Um, however, it's very important for the board to make note of them in their decision so that they're not overlooked as the project moves forward. Um, the third section is the submittal requirements. So Chapter 40B is unique in that it only requires the submittal of preliminary plans as part of the approval process before the board, which means then that the board has to include requirements for the submittal of final plans to make sure that what is actually ultimately put forth is consistent with what was reviewed and approved by the board. And these are very detailed in terms of what is required to be submitted for the final plans. There's all sorts of timing issues. Some things are required before the issuance of building permits. Some of them are required before the issuance of certificates of occupancy. Um, so that's actually in subsection D is construction completion slash certificate of occupancy. Um, subsection E, project design and construction. A lot of these are actually very general conditions that are applicable on any type of 40B development. And then you'll have a number of these conditions which are unique to this project. Um, the next subsection, subsection F, traffic safety concerns. And again, these are, um, these are actually very unique to this project and they come through the peer review process and the suggestions that were made by the peer review engineers. Um, subsection G, police, fire, and emergency medical conditions. Um, this is, again, a mix of standard conditions and project-specific conditions having to do with uh, police, fire, and, and other safety matters. Uh, subsection H, water, sewer, and utilities. Subsection I, wetlands, floodplain, environmental conditions. These are actually much less significant on this project than they have been on other projects because we're not within any jurisdictional wetland areas. Um, and then subsection K, other general conditions. So these are catch-all conditions um, for the end of the process. And then the next section after that is the waiver decisions. Um, and with the waiver decisions, what I've done is I've set forth what has been requested for waivers by the applicant. Um, I've operated under the presumption, the presumption that the board intends to approve this project and therefore where waivers are necessary for the project to move forward. I presume that waiver is going to be granted, um, but again, that's ultimately for the board to decide and these are only suggestions and the board can act however they want on any of the specific waiver requests. So that lays out sort of the bare bones of the decision um, and any questions, I'll be happy to respond. Great. Thank you. That was an excellent summary. Thank you. All right. So if there are no questions, and I give you a pregnant pause so you can have some if you want, uh, let's go to Ms. O'Connor, who can give us the applicant's reaction to the details that are or for the particular things that are in the draft report. Ms. O'Connor? Certainly. Um, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank the board, um, Attorney Haverty and Mr. Reardon, for their uh, diligent work on, on this application. So uh, the Housing Corporation does thank you. Um, with respect, I did send uh, 
Mr. Hanlon and Mr. Haverty, the comments of my client with respect to the uh, draft comprehensive permit. If you'd like uh, me to go through them um, uh, number by number, I can do that and I can give you the rationale. Uh, for my client's position. Is that okay with you, Mr. Hanlon? I think that's fine. Uh, you should exercise some judgment as to whether everything needs to be done that way. Some of them may be just pure details that don't yeah, need yeah, to be. Correct. Yeah, correct. But on anything that is is significant that we need to be focused in on that need, that goes beyond what the bare bones of the paper that you submitted. I should say that I've asked Ms. Ralston to include that paper into the record. So we have an index of it and all of the members of the board and ultimately the public will uh, will will see what what those are. So it'll make so you won't you don't have to mention anything just because otherwise it'll get lost because at least the paper will be there. Okay. Um, I, I would direct the board to uh, procedural history number seven, um, where it says 60 percent uh, 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 affordability of area medium income. My client would like fle the flexibility for it to be up to 80%. As Ms. Schwartz testified during several of the hearings, there will be a range of area median incomes that are gonna be used at this project, but they wanna have that flexibility for this site. And that is addressed in several other places in the decision. Um, with respect to uh, number 26 on page five, uh, which talks about long-term and short-term bicycle parking spaces. Because of some concerns raised at the last hearing as to appropriate space uh, in the garage and in other areas, what my client would like to, uh, the, the decision to read is that rather than say 70 long-term bicycle parking spaces and 10 short-term, they'd like to say the project will provide at least 60 long-term and at least five short-term. The intention is to provide more, but they want to have that flexibility. Um, next, uh, I just wanna point out that I believe that the request was for 21 parking spaces, Paul, um, and not 22, yeah, and that's correct. That Mr. Connor, yes, that's absolutely right. Okay. And there's uh, there's some other things that were in that, that as you know, you ended up you corrected them months ago and uh, and submitted something for the record. So we'll get that straight. Okay. Now, one of the important things to discuss tonight is the issue of uh, the waiver of fees, uh, permitting fees, and inspection fees, and that is page thirteen uh, of twenty eight number um, H and C two H I. Uh, now, I believe, and I did provide Mr. Klein and Mr. Hanlon, uh, what the board did with respect to the Westminster project uh, for the housing corporation. And they did waive 100% of all fees and inspection requirements with the exception of uh, water and sewer permit fees. The housing corporation would be looking for the same type of waiver here. Uh, if, if the board members wanna reference that language uh, that was included in that decision, that's at Middlesex South Registry of Deeds, book 67774, page 169A. Now, Zuccotta, could, I, could I stop you there for a minute? Sure. I, I wondered if, if I mean, as, as you said, Mr. Klein has been working on this issue, and I wonder if he has anything that he can add to where we stand on that. Uh, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've been working with um the the town manager um on on this question um and he has been working with the departments um we did receive confirmation this afternoon uh from the town that the town would be willing uh to offer the the same waiver that they had uh on the westminster project uh where the town would waive uh the permit and review fees uh with the exception of the the water and sewer connection fees so one thing I wanted to be clear is that we we don't understand this request, but in any event, it's not what we that I don't think it's what the town is with willing, willing to do. We're we're not really talking about the the costs of the safety details around the construction site and that sort of thing. If these are the kinds of fees that that were involved really in the in the uh, Westminster project, the safety details were not involved. Uh, yeah. Like police details, no, those were not waived. Yeah. 
Okay, so we let we can go back to the next one. I think is uh, before. The one immediately after the fees. That I would just go back to the list. Sure. Um, the next thing I have is D two B. This is the okay. uh, section that talks about submitting the property management plan to the board. We thought some of the requirements that we submit were a little overreaching. For instance, pet policy, smoking policies, staffing. Um, my client has no issue with respect to providing details as to building security, public access, trash removal, vegetation management, and the transportation management policies and procedures. We'd also wanna point out that the plan could not be submitted to the zoning board until it is approved by the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, which was formerly DHCD, because DHCD has to approve the plan as well. Um, the next is E8, um, and this is fairly significant. There was discussion at the very beginning of the permitting process that the project would be all electric with the exception of the hot water, which would be serviced by natural gas. Now, my client is proposing that the project will be designed to provide future electric uh, domestication of hot water. But at this point, uh, they are proposing that the project shall be all electric as to heating, ventilation, cooling, and appliances. Uh, the next uh, item of concern is E10. We want to make sure that we are only required to install underground the, the utilities we're bringing to the site, because I believe, and Nick can correct me if I'm in, not correct, that the cable is above ground, correct, Nick? Yeah, all the utilities in the street are above ground, and I think we just wanted to acknowledge a, a small language change here to say that anything that's entering the site should be underground, but we're obviously not going to be taking municipal utility services and putting them underground within the public right-of-way. Uh, the next uh, is E13, which talks about the hours, which is a totally appropriate of con uh, constricting construction. We'd like some language in there that if extraordinary circumstances are presented, that the applicant shall be entitled to request a waiver to perform work outside the hours by submitting a request to the director of planning. Uh, and I believe that there is precedent for this. Uh, um, we did this with respect to, you did this with respect to 1165R. You may recall that when they were pouring the floors for the concrete, they needed continuous pours and it couldn't be done within the hours. Concrete has to be you know, wet and soft and uh, it was that type of situation. So they would uh, look for that type of uh, additional condition in there as well. Mr. Chair, if uh, I could just interject for a second. Yes. Uh, apologies, Ms. O'Connor. Um, so in E13, the times that are listed currently, those would require a waiver already, um, which was not requested. The current town bylaw is uh, weekdays 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, weekends 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And that was that's Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Um, so if we do want to, sh if if these are the hours that are required, we, we would need to include a waiver to that effect. Okay. Um, but if the otherwise, if you're comfortable with what is currently in the, the town bylaws, uh, Title Five, Section 12 on noise abatement, um, then we can we don't need a waiver, but it would read 8 a.m. and uh, 9 a.m. as opposed to 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. No, we would we would look for a waiver as written the way the decision is written. OK, perfect. Thank you. Just want to clarify that. Sure. Thank you. So I have a question, Mr. Klein. What do you think if if Ms. O'Connor still has to give us a request for a waiver in order for us to act? Do we have to keep the hearing open in time for her I to think, do that? I think that I mean we have on some prior cases uh, put forward waivers that were recognized as being required uh, without a separate um, written request from the applicant. And Mr. Haverty, is that is that that makes sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should add this to the waiver list. And I'm happy to I, do that. We, we don't need the applicant to submit something formally. You know, they've made the request orally as part of this hearing, so we can add it to the list of waivers at the end of the decision. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Connor? Uh, next, F11. Um, my client has no issue with respect to coordinating the repair of the sidewalk from Broadway to the project site, but it would like it to say at the town's expense. Because as uh, Ms. Geller indicated at one of the hearings, um, DHCD does not allow money spent outside the project site. Um, so they would not be in a position to do that. This oh, is for um, the sidewalk between the site and and uh, Broadway? Yes. Um, with respect to G5, uh, I don't necessarily know that there is access for the fire department personnel. We don't think for to all four sides of the structure, but the fire chief has reviewed the plans and appears to be satisfied. So I think that if this is re revised to say, the project shall maintain access for fire department personnel as determined by the fire chief, um, that would be adequate. It is accessible from three sides at a minimum. I mean, that's fine with me. Ultimately, it's the fire department's call. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going to Mary, H5. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mary, did we want to touch on uh, F12 briefly? regarding the, the garage door? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, Pat had said they have my list and um, they're aware of some of the things that are, the, the garage door is not going to be recessed. You may recall from the hearing it, that the neighbors do not want the garage door recessed. So that should be stricken. Thank you. Okay. H5, um, uh, we would like, some language in there that the uh, Department of Public Works will work with the applicant on permitting disconnects to facilitate uh, the demolition of the existing building. I-3, that would be deleted because there's no stormwater management system. And the same with K-5. And those are my clients' comments, except for the minor comments that I sent you in the memorandum with respect to parking spaces, uh, number of uh, charging sta sta stations and the like. Um, I did not, they are in my memorandum uh, to you. With respect to the waiver list. Um, uh, but before we go to the waiver list, are you saying that there is no stormwater management at all on the property? No, no stormwater management system, correct. No, th there are. Paul, you're correct. That's what I thought. There's a, there's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's small, right? But it, right. but it's, it's, it's kind of critical that it gets installed properly and according to plan because you, what you don't want is you don't want a cross connection between the floor drains in the garage and the drainage system. So there is a, a modest drainage system. So I think it's probably prudent to keep that condition in there. Does that apply both to I3 and K5? I, I think it does. Again, it's not a huge obligation, but but there is still a, a leaching catch basin and right. and some some minor stormwater improvements. And there's also swales around the building and a requirement that you can't discharge the abutting property. So you know it's not a heavy lift for the for the applicant, but but it's it's important that it gets taken care of. Should should we strike uh, in that same vein? Should we strike the uh, the soil testing from it since we're not infiltrating? Uh, I didn't see a, a condition for soil testing. Where's that? A, didn't A6, this might be out of order, but I think A6 mentioned something about that that also referenced infiltration. I was I was about to maybe text Mary to say, is that this part of this that needs to be removed? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see any compelling need to require any soil testing. The soil testing is E12. E12. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Got to speak up sooner, Jeff. <laughs> this actually does illustrate exactly what the purpose of this hearing is, right? Because if we easily could have gone over it and gotten it wrong, and we would never have been able to fix it if we didn't have all you people here to chat about it. So, Connor? All right. So now I guess we're ready to move on to the waivers. All right. Paul, please note that um, the setback, uh, the rear yard setback is 24 feet, not 20 feet. I had, uh, and there are just some uh, 
points that I pointed out that it's the parking requirements for the residential, a uh, one space per residential unit um, would be uh, 44 spaces total with the commercial. Uh, we're talking 21 spaces. That's what we're looking for for a waiver. All right. So where are we looking at in terms of the, the setback being 24 feet? Which waiver decision is that? Which, hold on a second. Two. Two. It's a minimum, a minimum rear yard setback. So if the proposed is 24 and the minimum required is 20, is there a need for a waiver? No, no, no. So no, the no, 20, no, no. 24 is what's required and the recommendation uh, is five. Okay. So it's 24 feet, not 20? Yeah, it's 24 because it's 10 plus L over 10. Uh, it's a, it's a, Nick figured it out. So yeah, my eyes glazed over as soon as I saw that. Yeah, well, we're, we're lawyers, not mathematicians. That's why. Exactly. <laughs> um, Ms. O'Connor, I have a question on parking. Um, you're seeking, uh, my understanding of the way in which the parking works is that uh, there's an automatic 10% discount because this is affordable housing, which brings right. us down to 39-ish or something like that. And then the board has the discretion without waiving the bylaw at all, but a discretion under the bylaw to reduce the total amount of parking further down to 25% of, of that 39, which comes out to be about 10 um, which is well within the range that that you need. But the catch is there has to be some sort of uh, transportation demand management program, which is otherwise also already included in these conditions, which you haven't really addressed. Uh, and so I assume that you didn't object to. Now, obviously, nobody is looking for the kind of transportation demand management that involves, you know, giving people free fare cards and, and having bus routes and so forth. But there are a bunch of things that could be useful that have to do with uh, a number of transportation issues, some of which could be just pure demand management issues like providing literature about bus schedules, providing literature about how to get around Arlington and, and the neighboring jurisdictions using public transportation, which are the kinds of conditions that you've, I'm sure, seen in, in other cases and that we've used in other cases. Um, there also is potentially some things that might that have are related to demand management uh, that have to do with, for example, uh, uh, notifying people that they're not supposed to park on the street or or they're not in violation of the of uh, of the town rules, whatever the town rules may be at any given time. Um, and it would be, I think that that at least when I read what is already in uh, Mr. Haverty's decision about demand management. If there's a package of essentially notification kinds of requirements like that, that and that's what demand management means. And I assume that for right now, at least that's what I'm assuming that we would decide that it did mean um, whether informational type of requirements like that are problems that are would pose great difficulties for the applicant because it both would be enable us to not give you a waiver, but rather just say under the bylaw, you don't need any more parking than you've got, which if there's a good policy for not giving unnecessary waivers. And it also may give us the flexibility to address some of the other uh, issues that neighbors have brought up having to do with parking and the number and that, that stay within what you guys have got control over uh, but provide at least some assurance to the neighborhood that some of the th fears that they have uh, may not materialize. So all of that is a long way of saying, is is that a sort of thing that poses a big problem uh, for you or the sort of thing that you were kind of expecting was coming along anyway? No, absolutely not. We were intending to do a very comprehensive transportation management plan along the lines that you suggested. And as you know, this isn't the first comprehensive permit, I believe um, we did one for Westminster and it'll include just what you spoke to. We cannot, um, you are prevented from the subsidy because these people are on subsidy for charging for parking. Um, and the project is not in a position to give right. free MBTA cards and the like, but we will provide all of that information and we will have a very detailed transportation management plan. It is a non-issue. 
Thank you. So I have another question that has to do with the uh, town department of public works working with the applicant on permitting disconnects to facilitate the demolition of the existing building. Um, and I guess my, what I'm looking for is if you can, if you can help me understand, or maybe Mr. Haverty can do this. There's something that is a little bit, I mean, you're here before us and are subject to the conditions that we impose because that's what the conditions of the permit are. But the town department of public works isn't before us. And I'm not entirely sure why we have the jurisdiction to impose a condition requiring, uh, requiring anything from them. I will give it to Mr. Grosshandel to explain why he, uh, we felt that was necessary from Bald Hill Builders. Matt? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Which which component are you asking about? This is about the demolition issue with the Department of Public Works. The as far as the uh, disconnect yeah, permits. So the, yeah, you know, really the question came down to timing. Um, you know, certain municipalities will have moratoriums around doing work after November 15th and before April 15th for plowing reasons and so on. So I just want to make sure that we're working in concert with the DPW and the, the varying uh, departments just to make sure we're aligned um, based on when the project gets going and so on. Um, there are, that's uh, topic one. So the topic one will be around, um, sometimes what we may be asked to do when we go to do a disconnect to the existing building is we can if it does occur in, let's say, I'll make it up December, January, February in the plow season, um, sometimes they can make a special exemption to allow us to uh, do a disconnect in the roadway. Other times um, they'll let, have us do the disconnect under the sidewalk. I, again, I just want to make sure we're aligned in our expectations. The second part to this, and this is really just boots on the ground, as I went out recently to this site, I could see that the DPW or somebody's done recent road work out there. There's binder course down in the roadway now. There's exposed uh, cast iron structures and so on. So clearly there's going to be a finished uh, top coat that happens at some point. I'd, ideally, I'd like to work in concert with the paving operations for the new work so that we're not having to saw cut into brand new roadways and have to repair brand new roadways. If there's some way that we can work in an aligned uh, methodology, we can make sure that our work is done um, prior to the top coat going down. So, Mr. Havity, really more around best faith. Mr. Havity, I, I, I think I'm understanding more or less why it is that the requirement, why it is that the public works department, where the applicant needs that cooperation. But I'm a little bit unclear about what mechanisms we have to require uh, or otherwise induce the public works department to cooperate. Again, board is uh, acting in the stead of all local boards um, and commissions. And if, if permits are required for these disconnects, then they're they're issued technically as part of the comprehensive permit process. But obviously, the board is going to want the input of the DPW. Um, so, I mean, I do think that what is being proposed here is appropriate. And I take it that the actual input from the DPW is something that occurs in the course of their working together, you know, during at a later stage in the proceeding that we don't actually have to have the DPW in here saying that that they approve of this or that. Correct. It's for later on. Okay, thank you. The only other comment I have uh, is that we're looking for a waiver. The number of compact parking spaces, 60% of the parking spaces to be sized for compact cars. And those are the applicants' concerns and comments on the comprehensive permit. Mary, if I may, there was uh, also soil testing in C2J. That, so that's uh, the, uh, the comment about the soil testing and removing that. And the other one was uh, comments about a, a, a NEPTES SWIP, SWIP permit, which is uh, required for uh, disturbance, land disturbances greater than one acre. Uh, our lot is only 16,500 square feet. Uh, so thus it's not required. I do think that the, the NEPTES condition does say if necessary. It's generally how I have those conditions drafted. Oh, if necessary, okay. Yep. Thank you. So I, I did have some 
blanks that still need to be filled in that I was hoping to get from the applicants? I think since we were on the waivers, we can start <laughs> there. Um, okay. Waiver number three. I did want to touch on, on that one in particular, Mary and Paul, if I could. I think we were curious about the structure of that and wondering if we could um, modify the language to basically say that um, we're seeking a waiver from the requirement and the proposal is, you know, the plans that submitted which show a roof deck on the second floor of approximately 2,000 square feet and landscape areas at the ground floor. I, I mean, I, again, I, I'm i happy however you want to structure it as long as it's identifying exactly what is proposed. So there's a, a requirement of a 10% minimum landscape and 20% minimum usable open space. What Nikki, is being proposed instead of meeting those requirements? Nikki needs the percentages like from the procedural Well, I think my, my concern, Mary, is that um, there are specific prescriptive requirements in the within the zoning code that define what landscape area can constitute and what usable open space can constitute. And I don't think that the project is necessarily designed around 100% of those requirements. I think we've made a clear proposal to the board about what the character of the roof deck space will be and what the character of the plantings both along the streetscape on Sunnyside and around the three you know, other sides of the site will be. I think those are well documented in the submitted plans and in the landscape plan and the planting plan. So I would propose that you know, the waiver be uh, rewritten to say we're seeking a waiver from the 10%, 20% requirements and the proposal is to, you know, to build the plans as, as submitted. Mr. Chairman, um, I mean, I think it, it would be appropriate for the applicant if those percentages are 0%, let's put in 0%, but then also indicate that in lieu of, um, you know, providing, you know, that acknowledge also in the waiver request that the applicant is providing an alternative uh, means of providing outdoor space and landscape space that is and and do it that way but I you know I, I think it's important that uh, we do have an acknowledgement that you know the, the request there's a specific request being made and it's not sort of as open-ended as saying well we're doing something different Right. It, for, from my perspective, it's always better to be very specific as to what the proposal is for the waiver um, so that so that the board, if, if there's ever an appeal of a decision, I, I like the board to be able to be a point to their waiver decisions and say we were cognizant of exactly, you know, the, the, the extent of the waiver that was being granted and it's in our decision. Otherwise, you know, it it renders the board um, vulnerable to a claim that they've been acting in an arbitrary and capricious manner. So I'm a little bit unclear, Mr. Buren, as to, I mean, I, everybody always wants as much flexibility as they can have, but I'm, I'm, you do you do have a fairly specific proposal before we us. Do, we do, yeah, and, and I guess, you know, um, if there was a request to try to tabulate what those specific percentages would be based on the strict reading of the bylaws, we're happy to do that. Um, it just seemed more straightforward to say, we've made a very specific proposal to you. We'd like you know, the waiver to uh, grant us the ability to build what's been proposed and what you've reviewed, right? Well, let, they are talking about granting it, but they want the percentages. I think that's the answer. Yeah, I mean, I you know, if if Mr. Klein's suggestion of saying zero and zero, but we're choosing an alternative compliance path, and the board agrees that this is a valid path, that seems perfectly fine to me. I think I think the the, the problem is is that when we write the opinion, we are going to want to have a specific enough description of the alternative compliance path that it's clear to everyone that we know what it is that we were buying into and. I yeah, I mean, I, I it seemed like there was a precedent for this type of approach in waiver number one, for example, where, you know, 
as we all know, there's a requirement, you know, in the bylaws to provide a step back at a certain amount and a certain depth on the building. We've proposed a slightly alternative design. It's not zero, but it's something, and that's documented in the approved plans. And that's the way that the waiver is written, right? So, um, well, the way the waiver requested number one, the applicant requests a waiver to allow no stepping back, as shown on the approved plans. We, we, but we, there we, is stepping back on the approved plans, is my point, right? So the, the plans are approved with a step back at the fifth floor of a lesser dimension, right? So that's, I think, an analogous situation where we're proposing something that you know is different than the requirement. That's why we requested a waiver, and we've documented it with the plans that are you know submitted and approved. Nick, you can tabulate the numbers, correct? Yes, we can we can take a pass at tabulating the numbers. Okay. That's fine. All right. yeah. we, we will get you the numbers. Yeah. And the board can always in the board action where it's stating that the waiver is granted, we can also reference uh, uh, the approved plans as a way of proceeding. I think that would be helpful. All right, waiver number seven, the applicant requests a waiver to allow a reduction in the drive aisle requirement to, and I don't know how many feet is 22. being requested. 22 20. feet was discussed at the last hearing. 22? Yep. Yeah. Yes. And I know there were some blanks at the beginning oh. of the decision with regards to impervious area. Number five. Yeah. Number five, property contains significant pavement covering approximately blank percent of the property. It was 100%, I believe. Isn't that right, Nick? I think Jeff had that number. It's slightly less than 190 something. I'm looking for it right now. Do you know? Off the top right of your head? Yeah. I, uh, I'm looking it up as well. 95.9, uh, .9, I believe you said, and with a reduction to 89.49. 8949. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Proposed. So 95.9. Yep. And then the, the reduction existing... is to the, the reduction is to 89. Point what? 49. 49. Yep. Mr. Mr. Reardon, I just okay. uh, you you commented a little bit on that too. Are those numbers sound, uh, ring true to you as well? They do. I just have an issue with significant digits. So Okay. <laughs> Just to the tenth, please. Right, fair enough. Not to, not to the hundred. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> it brings back eighth grade. <laughs> and I think that's allowing more digits than we're allowed. But you know, <laughs> hundred is just hard for, to, hard for me to hard for me to. Okay. <laughs> got it. All right, Mr. Havity, you have some other things. So I'm just trying to say I know that there was. Do you have number six uh, of the waiver? It's Paul, 60% of the parking spaces to be sized for compact. Yes, yeah, so I got that from, from okay. what you sent in. All right. I think sure. that covers, oh uh, no, number 27. Uh, just proximity to the nearest MBTA bus stop. I mean, I guess, the board could provide that as well if, if you're aware. Yeah, so Broadway at Sunnyside Ave is the one that's on their side of the street, and Broadway opposite Sunnyside Ave is on the opposite side of the street. They're served by the 87 bus. Bus route 87? 87. 87. All right. And okay. Christian, you can give me that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, without absolutely. other things, I mean, it seems to me that, that as it is, it's important here. The 87 isn't the only bus that stops nearby, at least get subject to the snow problem that some of the neighbors have pointed out to. Going to Clarendon Hill gives you what two more bus lines and going to both the Green Line, as I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and certainly to Davis Square. So, uh, you know, you're really in a, the, the sunny side is really kind of only a, a part of the transit friendliness of this project. Paul, and I just want to point out that it's one space per dwelling unit, um, not 1.5. There was a revised waiver list. Yep, no, I got I got that um, okay. from your su suggested okay. changes. So I think that is all of the missing information that I have. Um, Let me see. I had oh, um, 
on on the project plans can you just give me the revision date so dated march 9 2023 with revisions through I just need to know what that date I'll, is i wish shall nick i have to rely on for that so i think I guess my question would be, we've submitted a lot of supplementary material at the hearings over the last couple of months. Should those be counted as the, re as the revisions and we establish the date that way? If, if you've know, I mean, submitted revised plans, it should be considered revision. Well, I, don't, I guess my point being that there have been plans that have been submitted and then supplementary material to complement those plans has been provided. Some plans have been revised, some have not, but there's, I think, a record of information that's been recorded. So I guess he's asking for your guidance as to how, how you want to date that. I go with whatever plans are submitted with the, the most recent revision date. And I don't want to put on a date that's not actually shown on a set of plans. Okay. The revised date on the Sam Yotis plans is August 1st. Thanks, Jeff. And Paul, you just typically reference the approved plans. The other material that Nick references is just factual basis for the board to make a decision on, not necessarily. Correct. Right. Yep. Okay. Mr. Connor, I have a question having to do with the um, hot water. Yes. Um, I'm if in in the language that you've suggested it almost is a requirement that you use gas for hot water and i don't know how long it'll take you to actually get your financing and build this up but that may or may not be what you want to do at that point i gather what what you're looking for here is is something that says you know something more like it like gas or electric because if if it were appropriate uh, you do electric and you just think that that won't that won't be the case at that point but you're not going to want to be have someone say you're not going to want to show up to mr champa and say well look i want to do electric and he says no your permit says you have to do gas that presume presumably we oh, no, right that, around that yeah that's not the intention the intention is that we not be locked into doing electric that we right. have the option at this point to do gas right that's what i would have assumed Mr. Chair, I just have a very minor uh, notation. Um, in throughout the decision, it, um, the architecture firm is sometimes relate, referred to as Utah Architecture, and sometimes it's Utah Architecture and Urban Design. I just wanted to ask which is the correct legal name. Our correct legal name is UTL Inc. UTL Inc. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So go, going through the decision a little further on E29, we've got a reference to diagrams uh, showing the turning paths, but I don't know who they were prepared by or what their dates were. I don't think that was provided, Paul. I think that's a holdover from the prior language. Okay, so we never got uh, truck path diagrams? We did. I don't believe we have anything related to CMP at this point. Okay. And I, I would just ask the applicant to confirm that. That's correct. We, we as in provided uh, from Samuels. Okay. Yeah, Paul. I don't know if that tip that was like condition that typically refers to like fire truck turning plans, which, yep. which in, in this in this case we don't have because the only access is from Sunnyside. There's no navigation through the site by a fire truck. Okay. This is for construction vehicles. Hey, Ms. O'Connor? Yes. Uh, E30 says that the applicant shall hire a licensed pest control company to conduct a comprehensive assessment of pest activity on the property and then develop and implement an integrated test pest management plan for all phases of the project before construction, during construction, post-occupancy. The use of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides is prohibited. Um, that I think we used in the most recent other uh, uh, 40B that, that preceded this one. And uh, it's it's a matter of some significance, as you know, given given what's going on in the town right now. 
uh, and I wanted to make sure you focused on that and that you have no problems yes. with that. No issues. Volatile uh, builders will take care of them. We have no issue with respect to the restriction on the, the pesticide. So, and you have no, you, you, the, 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 it also says at a wholly different subject that uh, construction vehicles will all be parked on site. Uh, I actually have don't have that in front of me, so that wasn't exact quote, but I the, in terms of making sure that the uh, uh, vehicles from the construction workers as well as the are not sort of parked all the way on the on the neighborhood streets. And I take it that that is a condition that you have no objection to. Well, I'm going to refer that to Mr. Grosshandler, whether that's accomplishable. Thank you. Uh, one of the comments that came up in one of the earlier hearings had to do with no parking on the Michael Street. And I, I suggested at the time that we'd be willing or amenable to accommodating that. There is uh, public parking and meter parking available on some of the cross streets. We'd like to have access to that. We are also looking into uh, negotiating some larger scale rental and or um, arrangements with some of the abutters to, to use some parking Um so the intent is to try to minimize the amount of on-street parking, but we would do so in a legal and uh, an appropriate manner. Is it? And I, but I take it that you still don't have any objection to uh, something that 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 requires you to notice that your parking crews should, are not allowed to park on Michael Street. That's something that would be matter a lot to the neighborhood. Yes, that's something that we've uh, consented to. Thank you. Um, and I take it that the, the there's another thing that isn't really described in here in the same detail that I thought, but uh, Mr. Connor, earlier you described something about the kind of meetings or the the uh, communications with the public during the course of construction to let people know what's going on. Um, and I guess I have two questions about that. One question is, uh, we don't currently have something that really is developed in the way that that you've described. Uh, we do have a precedent in the 1165 case, and we do have. Uh, I can, and I'm sure I can go back and 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 find your recording where you describe what you had in mind, which I think was a little more generous than that. Uh, and I guess I I'd like to ask whether, as part of the community that would be within that protection. Um, that it would be the entire the all the residents of Michael Street. Would that make sense? I think it would make sense. And frankly, um, anyone that would provide an email in that area uh, could certainly receive those notifications from volatile builders. Great. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Under, the under the conditions F8, uh, it, which is about electric vehicle charging stations. That is also a blank looking for a number. Two, it, the number is two. Two. And would there be consideration for future expansion? Yes, they're, they're uh, outfitting it so there would be future expansion. Correct, Nick? Yeah, I believe the number of future wired spots is five. So two day one and five in the future. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chair, can, can Mr. I ask a question on that? Yes. Um, I I remember um, just looking at the plans previously. There were I think there were four. Did we? Did you all reduce the um, number of EV? Uh, day, no, it's two, two times two. It's four. Of, it's okay, two so charging stations with two each on it. So four four parking spaces will have access. Correct, to right, Nick? It's two charging stations oh, with two okay. park, parking stations. Uh, yeah, that that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions that uh, the member of the board wishes to bring up right now? Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, Klein, uh, condition H six. Uh, which is the applicant should be responsible for all trash recycling, yard waste removal from the property. The town shall not have any responsibility. Um, I just want to confirm with the applicant that that's correct. Um, my client had no issue with that. Is that correct, Erica? I'm not looking at it right now. This is eight, this is eight trash six. removal, snow removal. What what was it? This oh, recycling. Six. Trash recycling and yard waste removal. The town shall have no responsibility for those. 
uh, the, the applicant will be responsible for the costs associated in, in organizing it. So, Mr. Hafney, yeah, there's also- We do actually- go Erica, go ahead. Uh, yes, we use private pickup at our other larger sites. So I assume we're not gonna rely on town trash collection. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, certainly snow removal. And then also uh, going down to I-4, uh, which has to do with um, fertilization, fertilizer and things like that. Um, are there any areas that, are, that would have a lawn at this time? I don't think there are. I just wanted to confirm that. No. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we'll be fertilizing. Much. Okay. So essentially what we would be striking is basically everything except for the last two sentences. So it would just read that the application of plant nutrients shall comply with 330 CMR 31. No other herbicides or treatment methods are approved. Correct. We'll just leave it at that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to check that out. Mr. Haverty, I wonder if you could, I'm hurriedly looking through to find the right paragraph, but you'll tell me quicker. Um, there's provision about what to do about snow and particularly what happens if there's not enough room for uh, uh, to put it on the site. And I wonder if you could remind us what that provision is and so that we can be sure that the applicant is in agreement with it. I, I can, can run through and find it. Um, essentially, just, it, it generally just, is that the if, if there are not sufficient snow storage areas on site, then they will have to remove snow and truck it off site. Yeah, but I just purely by accident, I opened it up to E18, which says snow may only be stored within the areas of the property designated for that purpose on the approved plans. To the extent snowfall exceeds the capacity of the designated snow storage area, the applicant shall truck the excess snow offsite. Snow may not be placed in or adjacent to resource areas. And I take it that that is something that doesn't cause a, cause a problem to the applicant. I did not for my client. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Uh, we're all kind of at this point familiar as to what that means. Um, before we open up to public co comment, I wanted to review some ground rules for effective and clear contact of tonight's business. Uh, public questions and comment will only be taken as it relates to the matter at hand, which at this point is practically everything, and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. In all probability, this will be the last session of the public hearing, and our focus will be on what the board should do to address the various concerns that have been expressed. Members of the public should keep in mind that we will not be able to receive any new information from the applicant or anyone else after this hearing formally closes. Uh, the chair will first ask members of the public who've logged in through Zoom and wish to speak uh, to digitally raise their hands using the raise hand button in the participants tab in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by the meeting host, after which you may un unmute yourself. Uh, and for those calling in by phone, please dial nine. And again, you'll be called on uh, by the meeting host. Please begin your comments by giving your name and address for the record. You will then be given up to five minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Remember to speak clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps generate an accurate record of the meeting. Once all public questions um, and comments have been addressed, uh, or if we've reached the hour, I'm just going to arbitrarily say 9.30, although I don't know that we'll go that far. Uh, the public comment period for this evening's session will be closed. The board, the applicant, and staff, which ultimately mis means the indefatigable Ms. Ralston, uh, will do our best to show the documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be displayed during your comment, please ask us to do so, and we'll do our best to uh, accommodate. So that said, uh, we'll open the public comment hearing and uh, ask if there's anyone who, in, who would like to address this application. Well, I'm not seeing any hands. Going once, going twice, going three times. Uh, I don't know that it makes much sense to go back and ask the board if they have something more since they just passed on the opportunity. There's, uh, Mr. Chair, I do. <laughs> before, we, before we do that, uh, Karina Liendo has uh, put her hand up and 
uh, she didn't really make it before going three times, probably, but I'm not going to be strict about that. Ms. Leando? Uh, this actually, uh, her husband, Roberto Costa, I got the forward the link. Uh, I still think the project is too big for the area. I still think there are way too many waivers for the building to fit in the footprint that it should fit. Uh, I understand there are economic concerns for that, that in a state that has a surplus budget and can afford uh, quality housing, I, I think that should be the priority. I don't, I don't think that should drive something as permanent as a five-story building in the area. I still have uh, concerns about forcing everybody to bike. Uh, Arlington, I think, will deprive the citizens to access to the town by forcing them to be on a bike. There are not enough bike lanes. And uh, it's not typically when, I, I guess when I've been most down in my life is when I most needed a car to get to places on time. Uh, the public transportation is not reliable and you can also have a second income, a like gig economy and Uber or something else. So I still think you, you're gonna need more parking lot, parking space than is required there. And uh, those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Costa. So is there anyone else with the public before I turn to Mr. Klein? All right, seeing none, Christian, it's all to you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that the, uh, the board is in receipt um, of a letter by the Concerned Citizens of Michael Street, um, which raises many um, important points that they have brought forward on a lot of the prior hearings. Um, and I, I think it's important that the the board look at those um, and specifically um, they have some requests and suggestions. Um, I think a lot of those have made their way into what we're looking at now. Um, they were looking to include the residents of Michael Street in the neighborhood construction update, which Ms. O'Connor has said um, they can easily accommodate. Um, looking to prevent contractor parking on Michael Street. Uh, the contractor has stated that they would be willing to do that. Um, they had concerns about using uh, Rodenda side, um, and that is included now in the in the uh, conditions. Um, there was a question: that, Could the HCA commit to, in writing that in the future overnight street parking permit stickers will not be issued to allow ten Sunnyside residents to park on Michael Street? Um, that is currently not allowed under the town bylaws, is my understanding. So um, I don't think that's something that falls within our purview. Um, and similarly, uh, making Michael Street one way towards Sunnyside, um, that is solely within the discretion of the select board um, and is not something that the, the ZBA um, is allowed to address. Um, and there were two other suggestions that they had, um, which had to do with the size of the building. Um, and I, I think we've we've discussed several times the issues about the, the size of the building and the economic considerations that go into that. Um, and that the you know the size of the building is currently allowed by zoning. So uh, it, as far as the, the height is concerned, not the setbacks. So I just wanted to to address that letter um, to, because I, I appreciate the effort that the residents went through to put that together um, and to provide that commentary to us. And I did want to acknowledge that uh, we are cognizant of that. We are taking um, much of that into consideration. Right. Mr. Klein may well, may well notice that the last several questions I was asking to the applicant all really came from, from that letter. Uh, there's one other concern that's expressed in that letter that is not something that I think that the applicant can directly handle, but I would like to understand a little bit better uh, what the possibilities are and whether there's any kind of action that the board could take that would be constructive. One of the things that's come up over and over in the hearing is that the during the winter, uh, the snow is not cleared off the space that goes between Sunnyside and Broadway. Uh, and I can, since I walk that frequently, I can attest that that is certainly the case. Um, I'm not quite sure who the who who exactly is the agency, but I'm sure it's a public agency that's responsible for the snow removal. Um, and I was, and obviously the residents here who after the 87 isn't running or if they're going in a place the 87 doesn't go, might wanna go to Clarendon Hill. 
um, it's it's an obstacle. And if you walk into the street, as many people, including me, do, uh, it's not entirely safe either, especially when it's snowy and icy outside. Um, so does can I, does anyone have an understanding that's better than I do with that as to what it is that could actually be accomplished for the safety of the people who live here and to improve the safety of the people who already live here? I think that might be a question we would need to address to the DPW as to who has jurisdiction over that, that area of sidewalk. There are, as, as we've just seen, there are several, there are lots of issues that are involved in this site where the applicant doesn't really have any control over that. Uh, the, the, either the select board, if it has to do with parking or possibly with the street uh, is who you'd have to turn to. And, and often, on these issues like the snow, the the applicant and the residents of this property, and the residents of the neighborhood have have the same interest. They they're they're not really conflicting. Um, if the board has any ability to, as we think through those things and the things that are outside our peer view, of to note them or at least to provide some way of communicating to the rest of the town that there are issues here that need to be addressed, uh, we we might want to consider doing that. So there's one other one other late speaker, and then I'm, I think that it's going to be time for us to move over, but Ms. Broder has her hand up now. Thank you. You'd think after three years of this, I could figure out how to raise my hand in a timely manner, but that's not the case. Um, first, just a sincere um, gratitude and appreciation for all of the hard work that this applicant has put toward all of these hearings. Um, at being on the design side professionally, I understand what that means. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. I think they have been responsive to many things um, as the designs have evolved. Uh, like um, Roberto before me, I, you know, I will continue with my um, position that the, the building is outsized for the site and that paving 89% of a site adjacent to a, a brook in one of the few urban wilds we have is, is not a good idea. Um, but I see where this process is going. Um, and so... Uh, it is what it is. Today, something came up that I hadn't seen before, and I have been unable to find the draft um, decision online to, to view it myself, but the um, request to extend construction hours um, to earlier in the morning, six or seven days a week, I would strongly suggest that the board does not allow that. We're talking about the long-term impacts of the building size to all of the residents, but we're also talking about the short-term impacts to people far beyond the abutters with that, with the noise of construction. And there's a reason that we have that noise ordinance. Um, so I strongly, strongly um, ask that the, that no extension of the construction periods be granted um, except for extenuating circumstances like the poor or, you know, et cetera. So that was it. Thank you all for your work and, and especially also to the board for all of their diligent work and for their real, um, I think the effort they've made to bring forward all of the residents' comments and to take them seriously. And it, it means a lot to be able to participate in this process and see that it's not just, um, uh, uh, that that it's meaningful and it's taken seriously. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Broder. That was very kind. All right. Is there anything else? I guess that we're not going to go back just to the board. Uh, and uh, if if there's any final comments, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Klein, uh, just just the the previous speaker's um, concerns. Uh, the current town bylaw allows for. Um, construction Monday through Friday, eight to six, and then uh, nine to five on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Um, and what the the board has typically done, if if uh, when requested to extend the hours, we extend it seven seven a.m. to six p.m. Monday through Friday, and between the hours of nine a.m. and five p.m. on Saturdays, and then disallow any construction activities on Sundays and legal holidays. 
Um, and so I, we, I do appreciate that, you know, it does um, sort of start the construction earlier, but it does guarantee that there's at least one day a week when there is no construction activity on site. Okay, this is, we're now, I'm, as much as you can tell that this, I, this is like a party that's so much fun, it's hard to leave. Um, but leave it, we must. Uh, if there's nothing more, uh, we're now at the point uh, of deciding on closing the hearing. Um, the uh, We've been at this for a long time. Uh, closing the hearing will be important uh, because it will mean that we're then sort of like a ballistic missile. We've been shot off and that where we land is already determined by where we've already been. Um, and so uh, uh, at, th at this point, uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Haverty, you should correct me if this is not exactly the right motion to make, but would entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing in this case, and to schedule the first day of our deliberations uh, for September the 5th, 2023 at 7.30, at 7.30. Mr. Haverty, is that satisfactory? Absolutely, yes. So moved, Mr. Chair. This is so moved by Mr. Klein, uh, Second. seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, let's go through the Roll. Uh, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Mr. Holy. Aye. Mr. H uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the public hearing in this case is now closed after uh, a number of months. The deliberation period will begin. Uh, I will say that I echo Ms. Ms. Broder and in, in thanking the applicant for their cooperation, uh, they certainly are sh are showing themselves. They are about to be residents in this neighborhood, just like the other people who appeared before us. And I'm hoping that by the time we all get together to celebrate the first anniversary of this, that that will it will be all uh, it will be a, a kumbaya moment. Uh, I also very much appreciate the effort made by Mr. Haverty, who's still got plenty of effort left to make, uh, and Mr. Reardon, who has been <laughs> who has been terrific at providing us with the uh, peer review advice that that we've met, met uh, and appreciative of all the members uh, of the board and all of their families who are putting up with a lot, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing the deliberations. Uh, and to seeing all of you, even if I can't necessarily uh, hear all of you for the rest of the donation. So with that, the chair would enter entertain a motion to, ad to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chair. Moved by Mr. Klein. Second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, go through the roll, Mr. Klein. Aye. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Ricardelli. Aye. Ms. Holy. Aye. Excuse me, that was Mr. Holy. Uh, and uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. And Adam, Le Mr. Blank, Le Jeez. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the acting chair uh, votes aye. So he can stop acting and turn it back over to the regular chair later. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank it's been all. a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.